What it comes across the beat to do is being a clock, so if I overrun, I apologise. Okay, so the first session of the day is uh, the villains and David and Chris. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to send you out if you don't shut up. <laughs> Honestly, you can't take him anywhere. Um, yeah, so the first session of the day is the villains, and two totally non-villainous people talking to us about being villains. So what we normally do with this um, is I'll just ask a couple of introductory questions, but I don't want to hog it, so we'll then open things out to, to the audience. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And both came up last night and stayed in our humble town. Uh, we, we found them a nice bit of Bedford to stay in, which is down by the river, so it's actually quite picturesque. The Guardian said it's Parisian. Oh. Uh, <laughs> didn't you notice? Uh, not, uh, not particularly, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just start, David, by asking you about your career and the beginnings of it, especially, because I think you were actually a schoolmaster. I was indeed, before. yes, yes. Did you enjoy that? I did indeed, yes, I did. Um, I was a schoolmaster, I'd been in, Cambridge, in, in the footlights in Cambridge, and I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to join this business or not. I mean, I, I just thought, I've always loved teaching, and teaching, I still do it actually, and, and, and so I started briefly as a schoolmaster, but, but sort of soon discovered that this, this bug, what an insanity, something not in my family, but definitely in my blood, was there, and I must either deal with it once and forever to get rid of it, so I'll go into the business, and I sort of haven't quite got rid of it yet, so I'm still, so I'm still working on it. And then I became an actor and a director at Salisbury Playhouse, um, and then, you know, then, yeah, yeah, don't want to go on and on and on. Well, then, but then basically how I got to Doctor Who, the route to Doctor Who was quite simple, was because I then got into radio, um, which I did uh, hundreds of broadcasts as a young man, um, and that led um, Ken Grieve to ask me to be Davros, because he thought it was a radio part. So he looked for somebody, when Michael Wisher couldn't do it, he said, um, can I, he found me, <laughs> as a man who was very experienced in, in radio, and also fitted the costume and the size of the part. So I was say, so I think that might have been fifty percent of it. Anyway, that's me. Something I was going to say at the beginning was that I, I have met David before, but it was forty years ago when I was a sick former, and David was appearing as in Time the Conways it was at the Connell Theatre in Worthing, and he very kindly agreed to be interviewed by two. Uh, geeky fanboys, age 17. So I reminded him of that last yes. night. Yeah, amazing, yeah. And if you ever wondered what happened to Davros's hand, 40 years ago David donated it and we raffled it. So that's what happened to it. I have no idea who's got it now, but that's what happened. But Chris, David mentioned um, the acting bug. I mean, was that something you've always had? Uh, yeah, I, saw, I think so. It was at um, school. I went to so many different schools as a child, moved around hell of a lot for one reason or another and uh, it was it was then it was at school really it started yeah, yeah. Um, did you do much school drama well there was an English teacher it's a classic story but there was an English teacher who, who said oh, we, we, we've got a drama he used to call a drama club and um, would you would you like to join my did and uh, I played lots of different things I played Shylock when I was 15 I remember I had a, a beard it was on a string, on an elastic thing. And at the end of the, the performance, I remember taking about the beard swinging forward. Uh, but we didn't know, the, you know, how to do things then. But uh, it, but that was the start, really. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I went to acting school when I was eighteen at East Fifteen Acting School, which was more or less an extension of Joe Littlewood's uh, Theatre Royal, Stratford Theatre Royal, and. Um, uh, that was 1968, left in 71, and on and off I've, I've been kept, kept going ever since. Yeah. 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 I'm going to ask one more question, which is um, I mean, obviously, you've got different mediums <coughs> film, television, radio, and so forth. Um, both of you have had to act under masses of latex and prosthetics. <laughs> is it fun? Is it uncomfortable? How did you find it? Very uncomfortable, actually. Yes, I mean, was, I mean, the, the whole experience was huge fun, but that part of it, uh, not ideal. No, I mean, you are you go into this 
it feels like going, well, it, with my mask, it was like, it, it was like going into a diving helmet. It's about to, if you're about to go to the ocean floor, and, and once on, with this thing on it, you can't, you can barely see, you can't uh, eat or drink, you can just drink, sit through a store, so you're in it for the day, I mean, and you can't eat anything. Um, and, and, and it took about an hour or a bit to put on. So it was you know, uncomfortable. And of course, when you sweated, as I did, when one and one, one, when we had about four retakes on a big move, when, Dal- when Davros is taking, leading the Daleks to war, um, we did this three or four times for various reasons, and the sweat was just pouring on my face. But you're unable, of course, to do anything about it. So it just sort of, it kind of trickles down and then finally dries up. Uh, so it wasn't comfortable, but the, but does that didn't sort of, uh, you know, that wasn't the, the the reason to do it. It was, it was a great great experience. And you're also having to pedal that. Oh yes, and, yes, yes. Well. Because although the, the lovely director said it was a, a radio part, no, it wasn't really a radio part because you were doing all this with your bum and you were trying to steer this thing. <laughs> You know, um, while being the master of the universe, <laughs> very, very, very low tech, I would say. You'd think they'd give him a nose for me. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. So, bum and feet. <laughs> yeah, yes, it was um, with, with Lord Kiff, which was 1986. Um, when I, when I came to do General Style, things have moved on so so much in, in every area of the production. Um, but but it, what it was, as David said, you, you're stuck under this stuff and you have to act your way through it, really. Um, but, you know, we, you're always grateful to have the job, but it was three or four. Three and a half, four hours in makeup, so getting there very early. You can relax in the makeup and just let people get on with what they've got to do, but and conserve your energy because it, it does take a lot of energy yeah. with, with those characters, doesn't yeah, it? It does, push yeah. yes. Yeah. And you're also deaf, aren't you? With, the... with 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 that, with General Starr especially, with with Kiv, I was sat all the time. It was on that table for the operation. My legs went underneath and the tail thing sat on top of the table. But with Kiv, the armour was very heavy, the head was was solid, um, a very strange sort of foam thing. It was like a balaclava shape. And then the circle at the front, they fitted on the mask and blended it into the uh, head. Um, so it was very difficult to hear, and with the helmet on, very difficult to see. So uh, you know, obstacles were there all the way, but uh, but it was worth it, I think. Yeah. It makes me feel that my Davros was very comfortable compared with that gatewalk. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually had Michael Wisher's mask, didn't you? I did. It wasn't yes. Yours. No, 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 nothing. The BB, everything was, it was recycled from. Um, but and you could always tell which is mine, which is quite funny. I think that. That they, 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 they didn't get a new mask, they, they mended the old one, um, and um, there's a, there's a bit of a problem around the mouth, and so you will always know it's me, because it looks as if Davros has been eating a Mars bar, rather rather indelicately, and there's still a bit stuck around the mouth there, so, so that's me, my wish I looks pristine and clean and clear, his mask, but mine was the same mask. Does Davros not eat Mars bars? No, oh no, he has Scarrow bars, I think he might have. <laughs> Could we just pause the slideshow, please? Just go to the single slide one, um, because I'm aware that it's running and it might be a little distracting for some people. Right, that's enough for me. So questions from the audience, please, for uh, uh, our guests. Stunned silence. Gentlemen here. We've had multi-doctor stories. Do you think they'll ever do a multi-dabber story? Uh, we've had multi-doctor stories. Will there ever be a multi-Davros story? Well, I hope. I hope. That would be lovely. It would be great fun. I mean, we meet together on these conventions and things, and that's fun. And it would be even more fun to meet actually on set somewhere. So, I don't know. I, I doubt it, but you never know. No rivalry between the Davroses. No, we're, well, you see, this is the thing. We're surprisingly good friends, actually. No, but not. No, I mean, Terry and I have great fun. You know, um, to when we, I haven't actually. I don't know Julian Bleach. I've never met him, but but certainly, I thoroughly enjoy the times I've appeared with with Terry, and we we um, try to out out face each other with horrible faces when people are taking photographs, and that's quite that's quite a nice one. I mean, you know, each one trying to be look worse than the other. If you see what I mean. So. Uh, there is actually, a, we're talking of masks and so on, there is a Davros face mask from, um, that, what was the children's magazine called? The 
Doctor Who. Adventures. Da- thank you. Uh, it was a freebie with that, and it's signed by all three Davros. David Davros is David signed it last night, so it's got David's and Terry's <laughs> and Julian's signatures on it, and that's up for auction for the charities. Um, questions from the audience. Uh, gentlemen, dressed as Colin Baker. So, uh, question for Chris. Do you have any memories of um, working with Brian Messer during the Mind Walk story? Um, no, well, only in rehearsal, because I, don't, I can't remember. I don't think we ever came into contact, did we? I, I can't remember. I don't think so. I don't think you had any scenes No, I didn't have any scenes with him, but I do remember him in, in rehearsal room. And a wonderful character, I mean, larger than life and lots of stories. I think we, I did talk to him about, um, was he, it was Edgar's, wasn't it? But there was also, we talked about Dixon of Doc Green and the characters in that. Um, but it was, it was good to meet him, but we didn't, we didn't have any scenes together. But uh, he's a, a fantastic man, yeah. Yeah. Steve. What made you ask that? Just because he's recently released some bits in Valtteri, he talks about his time on Mind Warp, he's got very fond memories of everybody, so it's just... Who else has remembered their stories? Right, yeah. We did uh, only in the rehearsal room, you know, the brief chats and cups of tea, and then you're on to something because it's all, you know, it's all very, um, uh, yes, it is really quite pressured. But uh, a good man, old uh, Brian, yeah. But it must be difficult for you to recall things that were, I mean, Destiny of the Daleks was 40 years ago, 40, yeah, yeah. 40 yeah. plus. Coming in 44. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's just, I mean, now, sometimes you, you have to read it. There are bits of people have written things, fortunately, and so you have to remember, ah, they're reminding you of what you actually did. But um, it was a very vivid memory for me. I mean, it was a lovely, a very, very happy experience. Um, loved working with Tom and so on, and, and Tom and Lalo were rather in good, rather good form at that time. And um, as I say, I think I mentioned a superb director, Ken Grieve, who sadly is no longer with us, but I mean, a brilliant director and a lovely company, the whole lot. Yes, yes. And we just, I mean, we had the luxury, which I don't think happens, I don't know if it happens, we had the luxury of rehearsal. We had ten days in the BBC um, you know, um, studios, and, well, rehearsal rooms, rehearsing. So you got to know people, and that was the lovely thing about those days. And then you went into the studio, and you made this link through rehearsals. Now it's, get, it's straight on and in and on and do it, isn't it? You yeah. know, which is... Can I say something? Yes, yeah, please I, do. I think that's a very good point, David, mate, because um, when, uh, when we did... Um, uh, trial of a Time Lord. There were, we did have that rehearsal period. When I did the General Style, and that was all, it was on film really, I suppose, most of it, um, not only was there very little rehearsal, I mean, there wasn't any really, it was just on the floor with the cameras and uh, um, the lighting and all that, and you're on. And that's tough enough, and all the gear and everything like that, but the, the other thing, and this is a, an actor's. Uh, the, the nature of the job. I hadn't worked for about two years before I got that job. And so oh, there was all that, the nerves of not having worked and, and can I still do it and all the rest of it and aware that people were sort of watching. Uh, so, and very, very little rehearsal. Um, I do like to rehearse. That's why I really prefer the theatre. In fact, David and I met and worked together in 1974 in two plays on a tour and we hadn't seen each other since um, until last was it last year or the year before a couple of years ago a couple of years ago yeah. and we, we didn't get time to talk so I'm really really pleased to have this opportunity that we can we can probably catch up with things today we already have actually when we we met met so that's how it can go and we picked up straight away from yeah. from where we left off in 1974 nearly 50 years ago it's unbelievable yeah. unbelievable we all feel this how time <laughs> just seems to go yeah yeah Gentlemen at the front. Um, uh, I've got a question for each of you. Uh, question for Chris is, what was it like channeling the energy of a general uh, and, of course, a Centauran? And a question for David is, of course, recently there was the collection box set for season 17. What was it like, uh, and you filmed uh, Scene Stavros for the trailer. Yeah. What was it like returning to that character after so long? And uh, did it come back naturally, or was there... I thought it was really good, actually. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I, 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 no, I hugely enjoyed it actually, and, and it was lovely to redo it. I mean, to, and I, 
I, I saw crikey, because I, I, I think my, my voice is better than it was in 1979. Uh, and I've done a lot of work on it, and I think it's had deeper tones, and, and I felt actually it was quite good. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed doing it, put it like that. I really did. And it, and it was lovely to read it. The answer is yes, it was terrific to revisit it. Yeah. Have we all seen the trailer David did for the convention? Okay, have a look at the website or the Facebook page because David very kindly did us a lovely trailer in character for Bedford Two Charity Con and it's, it's marvellous, you've got to see it. Following on from the, the previous um, answer I gave or the, the, what I said about the um, coming into something again after a long time, also the, the, the pace of the, that, that new launched uh, Doctor Who was, was, it was like, it really was like a, a rolling train. Uh, and I just had to take from the script the character, find what I could, use whatever energy I could muster uh, with the nerves and, the, and, and concentrate and just do the best, best I can, really. Um, he, was, he was a strong old character, old General Stahl, um, and uh, they're, they're quite a race, the old sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a good experience, and it took me to another another level with the, the energy for and fighting through the makeup and the costume and all that, which was all very very heavy. Do you remember how you decided? Sorry, do you remember how you decided on the voice? No, again, that that sort of came. I suppose a lot of that was to try and get through this thing, and you know, and he was a general and he was in charge, so it was it's it's remembering. Um, uh, people you've seen before, voices you've heard before, and um, not, not necessarily consciously, but it sort of summons that up, the, the, the authority. And it's larger than life as well, of course. It, it is not pantomime, but it's, it's, uh, these are extraordinary characters, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And therefore fun to play, I presume. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. And there's some humour to be found in these, in these. There has to be to sort of, you know, enrich uh, the, those characterizations. Yeah. Um, gentlemen here. <coughs> you, uh, you both talked about the difficulties of working through prosthetics and acting. Can you just give us a bit more a bit more story about how you deliver that? Especially David, that must be strange in rehearsals when you're trying to put this really OTT performance because you know you're gonna to have to work through prosthetics and everybody else is just working at a normal level. Yeah, um, Yes, I, I mean, I gather that Michael Wisher had a, did it all with a paper bag over his head. I don't know. I didn't. Uh, even paper bags were a bit expensive at the BBC in those days. <laughs> but they certainly couldn't afford them now. Um, but, um, but no, I, well, I, I, I sort of used the rehearsal time because, as Chris was saying, we want to relate to each other. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, I mean, although you're working through this latex, I just, so I didn't push the volume in rehearsals. I tried to get the, the Michael Wisher voice. I tried to do the, get it right, but that was you know playing off Tom and and particularly. Um, and then when you, when I got into the studio, it was it was suddenly a bit of a shock because you had the latex on, and what you'd been doing quite naturally had to be done by times ten, um, and you just have to give it more energy um, and use, as I say, the nerves and the, and the adrenaline to push it through. I mean, any mask wearing on stage requires a lot of extra energy, vocal energy and sort of internal energy. And, and you just, on the day when you're in there, you do it. So, so, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Marvellous. Lady here. Favourite Doctor Who story to watch. <laughs> Destiny of the Daleks. Oh, yes, yes, Destiny of the Daleks. I, I do, do recommend it. Yeah. Blu-ray now, and yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes, I, I can't. I can't think. It's like children, the usual thing, and all that. The, 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 um, but I do remember I, when Doctor Who started. It was 60, 1963, 60 years ago, of course. I was thirteen, and and uh, Wilf, uh, William Hartnell. I nearly said Wilfred Bramble then. <laughs> um, William Hartnell was was wonder. I thought he was wonderful. He'd also I'd also seen him in Brighton Rock. He playing playing a villain, and of course <coughs> Sergeant Major Bullimore in the Army Game and things like that. He's a wonderful actor. Uh, so I've got a soft spot for him. But each of the doctors, I've I've, I've worked with several of them, 
work with Sylvester on, on, on stage in uh, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, uh, an, an Italian political farce, before he became a doctor. Uh, and then, uh, so they all have their, they all have their merits. It's, a, it's an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I, I don't think I've, I don't know. I, I mean, just really, really I did like um, very much um, Jodie Whittaker's first, uh, particularly her first one when she went her first episode. I thought it was very, very good, and thought it wonderful to see a woman doing it and being done so splendidly by her. I do remember that one very, very clearly. Time for a couple more. Um, gentlemen in glasses, second row. Um, yeah, question for Chris, really. Could you, obviously, uh, for us of a certain age, Young Ones is completely iconic, uh, anarchic start of alternative comedy, really, that just really became so popular. Can you tell us about how you got into that and working with those other guys and how it felt at the time? Yeah, yes, um, that's, it's 41 years ago. Again, unbelievably, 1982, six episodes in 82, six in 84. Uh, I was doing, well, funny enough, I was doing that play, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, at the time. And um, uh, Maggie Steed, actress called Maggie Steed, was in it. Her partner at the time was Andy Delator, who was Francis Delator's brother, but also part of the alternative comedians. And um, he recommended me to, to, to read for this Mike, the Mike character. Originally, it was going to be Peter Richardson, who was director, writer, actor from the comic strip, created all those things and the comedy store. But I think there were political, artistic differences somewhere along the line. I didn't know any of this until afterwards. Uh, and I went along and read, did some improvisations with a, a few of them. And then I was asked to do it. It was tricky because we it was to do a pilot show. Uh, so there's no guarantee of a series. And I had to find this character um, very quickly. Uh, and then, of course, they decided to do this series. So those decisions, or most of those decisions, had to stay. I wish, in retrospect, that I'd done it in a different way, actually. Partly, I also feel that it may well have been better if they'd had someone from their stable of, of the alternative thing. However, that's how it, how it went. Um, they were fantastic. Those, those, Rick Mayo, Adrian Edmondson, Nigel Planer, Alexi Sale, all those others who came in from that circuit, they all had so much energy, clever, witty, bright. Um, they, they were great. I, I felt the odd one out, but that's, that's me. Cause I, and I often feel that with television and with film. I was saying to David earlier, I'm, I feel it takes a hell of a lot. That's why I need rehearsal. Uh, to feel relaxed in front of a camera, even w w in this situation, which is great because you're all friends. I mean, you're friends of the programmes and, and all the programmes. Uh, but it's, it's again, it's that classic thing of uh, many actors who, who are comfortable playing other people and not speaking and being themselves. You know, it's a, there's a, so many people will say the same thing. But it was, yes, it was a great experience. I wish I'd been more relaxed and comfortable and I could have enjoyed it more because all my energy went into concentrating, um, trying not to make any mistakes, again, because it's such a technical thing and we had so many explosions and special effects uh, and the pressure was on every day. One episode a week, two weeks filming, before the uh, series to do all the outside shots, then in the studio, a couple of days on the floor, then in produce, what they call the producer's run with all the technicians coming in. Changes being made all along the way with the script as well. Uh, and then the audience on the, the, the second day. First day in the studio is the pre-recording. Second day, cameras in front, audience banked up. So you're sort of, it's just halfway between theatre and, and, and television, really. So you're acting over the thing. You have to be very careful. It's a, a fine line. Uh, but a great experience. And thanks for the question. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Time for one more, yes, sir. Um, just to follow on from that, did you find that because of the popularity of the young ones, you became known for comedy afterwards? Did that affect your work afterwards? Well, that, for television, it seemed to go that way because... Um, uh, because, but again, Rick and A kindly asked me to do uh, Dave Hedgehog in Bottom, and, uh, and Jennifer Saunders asked me to play Marshall, one of her ex-husbands, in the absolutely fabulous thing. And then I did a couple, I did 
two episodes of One Foot in the Grave. One I played a, a plumber, and then I played twins who were builders. Um, in, and I, so for television, apart from Doctor Who, um, it, it has been comedy. But as far as theatre goes, it's it's everything, you know. Yeah, but it, 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 again, it's it's a commercial business in terms of television and and, and film because people are cast really on how how they look or what they've done before so it's it's a battle to try and do something a, a bit different but in theatre and David of course all the years in radio will tell you that that um, you can be anybody any age any gender any nationality and in any time radio is a fantastic medium um, it's uh, uh, so radio and theatre would be my my first First loves, yeah. Do you have a favourite medium, David? Um, I don't know. I think we all joined because we were as at school. I mean, uh, you know, we got into the into plays and, and loved the feeling of an audience. I, I I think now I would say radio actually because you don't have to learn it, <laughs> which is quite fun, very nice. Um, but but I mean, radio. It's Chris. Well, Chris has just done a wonderful commercial for radio for an, an actor. I'm a character actor like Chris. And I played literally hundreds, literally hundreds of parts on radio, from the very, very tall people to very, very, I mean, to nice people to nasty people. I mean, every single, and accents. And, and that led me, as I say, into television and into Bergerac. I, did, I got the job entirely because they thought I could do a nice Sark accent um, alongside, um, which I did with lovely, um, with uh, uh, not, um, uh, yeah, Tim, Tim Wilson. Um, but, but I think probably the stage is still the thing, an audience actual live, it's different every night, it's a very exciting thing, it's quite ter terrifying in some ways, but it's also wonderful, I think I think ultimately it has to be the stage, because you get this reaction which is unique, isn't it, every single night then you have to strive for those laughs and you want to keep those laughs you got on the first night you've got to keep them on night you know, when you've been doing it seven weeks or something but no, I think for me it would be the stage Yeah, uh, me too and, and it's, you get that rehearsal period and you get the run of the play. If you're, if you're in a longer run, you've got eight shows a week, so you can refine it. Uh, whereas there isn't the pressure of the television, no rehearsal or very little. Um, so I would agree with David on that. Yeah, and you can, you can, you can refine the thing as you go along. So you, that's the fun in a way that you, like you wanted to do with your telly, but you, could, you can do that on the stage because you could develop the character, you can develop the situation uh, in, with all the other people too, with, with your cast and with your, your fellow actors. Yes. I think I'd like to go on for another couple of hours, actually, but we're running towards the end of this session. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Lyon and David Goodison.